All right. Um, so today on the first uh, Security Plus lesson, it's honestly not a not the most exciting objectives. But these objectives are the more general or vague objectives before we get into the uh, the gritty details of some of like the attack types and all that fun stuff. Um, not a whole lot of like not, not a whole lot of uh, objectives that you really have to uh, overanalyze today. But there are a truck ton of possible test questions. So as boring as some of these uh, objectives are, like the legislative terms and all that fun stuff, make sure you're taking notes. Um, in my opinion, a lot of the, uh, the fun acronyms and whatnot today, they should be free points in the exam. I mean, if you remember what they are, they should be gimmies on, on your Security Plus exam. Three points. Man, it's awfully quiet in here for having like 60 people. <laughs> Had some technical difficulties on my end. Um, What's up, buddy? See. Hey, man. Wait, can everybody everybody hear me all right? We were uh, we were fighting with the uh, Discord audio. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we're yeah, good. You're good man. Okay. It went from being super quiet to sounding like I was in the back cave to hopefully relatively normal now. I can hear you. Nice. Audio will be super clean now, and then on the YouTube recording, it'll just be uh, echoey. <laughs> Toddlers lurking. No questions on the Security Plus exam, how you register for the exam, anything. We're about to pull the trigger and uh, get moving here. Um, I didn't register for the exam yet, but like, I'm deep into it. It's just right now, I'm trying to find a little bit more labs. I've been doing a little bit more labs and just studying the security. Um, security okay. Plus. Solid. Uh, well, for those of you that haven't registered for a CompTIA exam, remember, you don't register on CompTIA's website. You go to Pearson View. I'll throw that in the chat. Pearson View is the uh, the test proctor company that will handle most of your IT certifications. So if you haven't made a Pearson View account yet, you, you probably need to jump on that before you start thinking about planning the test. Yeah, I never knew. How would I compare the weight of Security Plus compared to A Plus and Net Plus as far as memorization? Uh, you, you want the honest truth from that? <laughs> yeah, see it. Uh, um, there's probably more to memorize in Security Plus than A Plus and Net Plus combined. Wow. Yeah, it's. I mean, there are some overlap, but man, there are a truck ton of acronyms. Yeah, I um, see at the bottom. <laughs> It's it's not probably not a bad idea if you're taking notes to have a separate complete separate acronyms list, because um, even even today, like for example, we're going to talk about SOC, <clears throat> which is Security, Security Operations Center. Center. It's also SOC two and SOC three audits. It's also System on a Chip. Mm. So, so, and uh, I think the only one of those we don't talk about today is system on a chip. So the acronyms become a huge pain in the ass. So <laughs> to definitely have a have a separate acronyms list if uh, if that's worrying you. All right, go ahead and throw an emoji in the chat for ready to kick it off. Yep, Quizlet or Anki for flashcards. I would definitely suggest making some. I think the Security Plus exam is like 350 US dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Around there. It's been a while since I've purchased my own vouchers, but I think it's in the 300 somewhere. Uh, question, when does this version expire? 
I have no idea. That's a great question. Uh, I think it was, <laughs> um, it was like 2024 or something. <clears throat> I was just talking, not talking, but watching Professor's Mission video. And it said that it's like, it's not two years, it's three years from this. Um, yeah, so, I mean, typically when there's a new CompTIA exam out, like, let's just say the next Security Plus comes out in December or whatever. Um, from the time that that new exam comes out, there's a six-month overlap where both exams are able to be taken. Um, but whatever Security Plus exam you have, that that exam will be valid for three years. Gotcha. And if you you know if you plan on taking another higher cert, you know that may uh, update your Security Plus automatically. Hmm. Good to know. All right, let's kick into it. I'm hoping this looks familiar. The CIA triad. If you were in A plus and Net plus, you uh, you had eyes on this, right? So confidentiality, availability, avail, availability, availability. My uh, caffeine's kicking in more than my my speech is, and then integrity. Um, so confidentiality. What does that mean to you? Someone define that in their own words. Uh, keeping your data like private to yourself, secured. secured, secured, making sure that only specific people who are authorized to encounter that data can, right? Keeping it confidential. What about integrity? And this one is going to be a huge topic coming down the road because data integrity is a uh, very good in the chat everybody said not changed right so some of the most vicious attacks involve changing data not not so much just stealing data um i think i think kind of the standard thought process when someone gets hacked their data gets stolen which is bad but it can be even more damaging if data is changed so when we get to the uh the attack types and attack vectors chapter that's a bit more detail you'll see what i mean by you know, how many attacks really do some savage damage by changing data? And availability is simply that, making sure data is available. Um, do we remember the five nines phrase that we talked about that was associated with availability? That's, that's uptime, right? Like, it's, yeah. there's, there's varying levels of nines that um, data companies strive for for downtime per year. Very good. So if you have not heard of that before, that 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 quote five nines simply means 99.999% uptime. And if you did get a question on Net Plus or Security Plus about how much downtime that is per year, it's about 30 minutes of downtime. So that five nines phrase is another way of kind of saying high availability that's pretty good 30 minutes a year down that's a pretty solid uh quote unquote downtime right that's wild no i don't think i don't think the CompTIA test is going to get that dirty where it's like how much downtime 28 minutes 30 minutes or 32 minutes no I think it would be more like, if they did ask you that, not that I'm giving you direct test questions, because I can't do that, but if they did ask you, it'd probably be like five minutes, 30 minutes, five hours, or five months, and you'd have to pick between those. Um, so you don't have to memorize the exact minutes. Uh, not really uh, a critical point. Good question, though. Yeah, six, six nines is like a few minutes or something crazy. Damien, uh, the one that I've posted is actually five nines. I think five nines is six minutes. Five nines is six minutes? I just looked at it. I think that's even from your net plus notes from the last class. I could be wrong. I think in that chart there was the, the weird six nines up top. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, sorry, troubleshooting some uh, sound issues in the in the Discord. 
So that was six nines, huh? But don't be surprised if you get the same basic questions on confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Oh, was it was the four nines about thirty minutes? I could have that chart mixed up in my head. I do make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> All right, so my bad, my bad. Five nines is uh, closer to five minutes, not 30. I might have to go back and make sure I didn't jack that up in net plus too, by the way. Either way, in the rare chance that you get the question about how much time specifically, um, just know that when you see that term five nine, make sure you mentally connect that with this high availability, like a high availability server. I know. It's the amount of coffee, man. Dangerous coffee. All right. Here's your first fun acronym. A CSF, or Cybersecurity Framework. Has anybody ever heard of NIST? N-I-S-T? No, I've never heard of it. Um, the overarching group for something. I completely forget, though. Yeah. National something. Yeah, so NIST, um, first of all, when you hear that term framework, don't overthink that term. So a framework is just a set of best practices. That's all it is. And, and I had a few questions on that this week. Um, I, I know some of you were looking for more specific definitions for that, but a, a cybersecurity framework is just that, a suggestion of best practices. There is no single framework that will get down to the details to guide cybersecurity in every organization. So whenever I think of a framework, it's a resource for best practices. Don't don't let that fool you into to making you think it's more technical than that. Um, NIST is the big one, and you're going to see this referenced a lot um, in in security in general. So NIST is that national, it's a National Institute for Standardized Technology, I believe. Don't quote me on that acronym. I'm terrible at acronyms. But <laughs> it is a gov website. So a lot of the security environments spend a huge amount of time kind of aligning themselves to these NIST standards. Um, most, most best practices that you come across in, in cybersecurity will have some kind of roots or details stemming from this NIST standardized governing body. Do you have to memorize NIST standards? For Security Plus, you do not. So I would put that in your notes. Do not memorize specific NIST standards. Don't stress about that because there are like over a hundred of them. And when you see, you're going to see references like uh, NIST 800 and then a number. You do not have to memorize those for Security Plus. I have never seen a question on the specifics of the five categories either. I would bet money in Vegas that if you get questions on Security Plus about NIST, they will be very vague. Just wanting to know that there are a governing body for frameworks or best practices. So no stress there. No stress there. And we will come back to some other standardized uh, frameworks that pop up uh, throughout this section. All right, for those of you that have uh, been studying some Security Plus topics, did you guys come across any security roles terms? So, like the SOC analyst, you know? Well, SOC analyst, yeah, the CSO or CISO, uh, ISSO, those kind of things. Well, SOC, <laughs> 2, SOC 2 is an audit type. I never... I had an interview with like a security analyst, and that was the most hardest interview of my life. <laughs> yeah, and, um, 
they, they kind of, you know, it, it kind of all, all the terms and um, acronyms are definitely real and definitely true. Because man, I really don't understand half of them, half of the um, terms and acronyms that they were saying. Well, I, I I can guarantee you by the end of this class, you'll have at least a better understanding of the acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So. Continuing with these basic terms for lesson one, right? Security roles. You're definitely going to get questions about like the CISO or CSO versus the ISSO. And think of the, the CISO as kind of like the director, the person who's in charge of, of the entire security group. So the, the CISO isn't the one that's like actually analyzing threats in the SOC. This would be more like a director level position you could have a CISO or a CSO or like a VP of cybersecurity they all kind of fall under that same upper management category um, you know it, it I always think of military terms like uh, if you were in the military this would be like your battalion commander uh, any, any veterans in here Love me. <laughs> Bubba said yuck <laughs> but for those of you that weren't in the military you're not going to find your battalion commander at, at your workplace every day they're not going to be fixing vehicles and cleaning weapons every day with you uh, they're more of an upper management kind of position right at least I didn't Bubba, did your, your, your battalion commander ever come down and clean weapons with you? <laughs> ours didn't definitely not <laughs> So when you think of the CSO or CISO, think of that as an upper level kind of uh, upper tier management position versus the ISSO. So the information system security officer, if, if the organization has an official position labeled this, right, this would be the person in charge of the actual technical staff. So, in my mind, like a classic setup would be at the top, you have your CISO or your VP, whichever whichever one. And then below them, if, there, if it was a large organization, you would have ISSOs who manage groups of like cybersecurity analysts and cybersecurity engineers. So the ISSO is typically the one that manages the technical staff that actually do the, the groundwork. Now... It definitely depends on what type of organization, how large it is. Um, you may go to work and become a cybersecurity analyst, and you don't have an ISSO. Everybody just reports to one CISO. So it, it, it's not like every cybersecurity environment has every single one of these job roles. Well, Quickie, that's a good point, yeah. A CISO is definitely... They're... They're the bridge between the cyber and the business side of the organization. Um, and to that point, like the CISO is the one that has to present like the executives with the cybersecurity information. Like in my job, I don't have to go talk to the executives of my company. Our, our VP, who's basically the CISO of our group, does all of that. So that's a good point too. The CISO is uh, definitely the the officer that has to go explain the cybersecurity uh, <laughs> cybersecurity environment to the executives. Are, are these definitions helping? Help me us kind of understand the difference between CISO slash CSO versus ISSO. Definitely. These these should be. I mean, honestly, these should be free points on your exam. Gift wrapped. Am I explaining these well enough? Perfect. Perfect, perfect, good. Good, great, great, wonderful. All right, let's talk about a SOC. Well, oh, I should say the first acronym SOCs that we see. So I, 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 I borrowed this screenshot from somewhere, but I like the fact that they bring up the definition, a, a security operations center, right? 
And traditionally, like in a huge network, you would have your cybersecurity engineers, your analysts, maybe even your network engineers, if it was condensed enough, in the same kind of area. Um, since COVID, you know, a lot of a lot of security jobs are going remote. So you may not encounter a lot of companies that have, hey, all your cybersecurity professionals are in one room anymore. You, you might, depending on the environment. But a SOC is your classic area where all the cybersecurity incidents are managed and monitored in an environment. Speaking of that, is anybody looking for uh, purely remote work? I pin, yeah. Well, I'll see you. I, I did pin the uh, the remote job links in the uh, the career Discord channel. I think there's three websites that have just remote jobs. So you, you will find both. You'll find jobs that require you to be in a SOC, and other ones require you to log in. Nice, nice. <laughs> and, and friendly reminder, this is uh, SOC definition number one. So there are a few other acronyms with the same letters coming up. Uh, qu quick time out. How is our pace fine? Is are we going too fast, too slow? Good here. Well, the pace is fine. Solid, solid. It's hard for me to gauge when I've had this much coffee, right? <laughs> All right. Good, good. Solid notes. Another fun acronym: DevOps or DevSecOps. Now. Again, some companies will have a traditional either person or group defined as DevOps or DevSecOps, development security operations. Some environments do not. Now, here's a lot of words. Don't worry about writing all this down. But this top definition, I think, is really clear. So DevSecOps or DevOps, right, it's an approach to culture, platform design, and integration. So when you see this term DevOps or DevSecOps, if it's security based, it's talking about a, a more modern approach to attempt to have a holistic view of, of a company. It opens up communication between developers, security, and what they call the IT uh, uh, personnel. So I don't know if you've ever kind of thought about this, but when you think of IT, you know, there are developers. I would say there's like the IT part, the infrastructure, whether it be like the help desk or, you know, the server support. And then there's security, the security personnel. Like my job, I'm a, I'm a cybersecurity engineer. You would think that all three of these groups were pretty fluid in communication. Um, but that's sadly not the reality for a lot of companies. A lot of the times, the developers are in their own world, security is in their own security mindset, and help desk is just putting out fires left and right. Um, yeah, network engineers. I would throw a network engineer with like the infrastructure. Um, so on your Security Plus exam, this DevOps term is talking about the modern approach to try to streamline communication between those three or those different groups of IT professionals. Kind of a weird thought process if you haven't really encountered it. I mean, I remember early on in my studies, I always thought, hey, security and the developers all are on the same page all the time. Um, that's a, that's a, some, sometimes that's a, that's a Disney dream. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't really happen that way um, fluidly often. Does that description of this term help us? Um, because on the exam, that's pretty much exactly how you're going to see it. The attempt to streamline communication between those groups of professionals. Yes. Does anybody work with work with developers or network engineers or security engineers and 
Um, you just want to scream at them sometimes because the communication I mean, is a challenge. <laughs> um, I help with scripting, and I still need to. I mean, nice, nice. <laughs> Wolf said, "We don't talk to each other." <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, believe it or not, that's that's not uncommon. Um, I, thankfully, I'm lucky enough to where, you know, our my security group and the developers we have kind of really good communication. Um, but in a lot of environments, man, is, is it a train wreck to try to try to relay information between those those environments? <laughs> Some of you are going to get jobs in like a year later, but oh my God, that fat guy on Discord is right. <laughs> we can't talk to each other. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. All right. Talking about uh, fun fun acronyms, you have CERT or C-CERT or CERT. So... Yes, can you Google and find specific differences between these? Absolutely. Realistically, all three of these terms, whether it's cyber incident response or computer security incident response or computer emergency response team, on Security Plus, make sure you know that all three of these certs just mean, hey, that, that is the cybersecurity or the security first responders. And first responders is another word that you might see um, pop up on your exam. Now, I, I borrowed this uh, this screenshot from CSERTAmericas.org, but I like the fact that they bring up firefighters, right? When you when you think of first responders, you're thinking of firefighters, police, EMT. Um, this term for first responders is more of, hey, we are under attack or we've experienced attack in some way, shape, or form. This group is the first one that steps up to mitigate and prevent that attack from doing damage. Just like a firefighter is going to put out a fire in your house, the C-CERT or the CERT team is going to be the first responder that says, hey, here's the actual attack. What do we do first? And look, this screenshot even gives us another one. S-I-R-T. All right. CERT, CERT, C-CERT, or CERT. Whichever acronym you like best, go with that. But on Security Plus, they won't differentiate all those crazy different types of acronyms. You need to know that those are all just first responders on the cybersecurity side. How many people just Google the difference between all those? <laughs> Don't lie. I use them both. You can. I just, I just wouldn't recommend it. Any questions on these so, fun first responder acronyms? So what would you recommend? So what would you recommend? Um, I'm the first responder. Like you said, don't Google them or something. Oh, okay.
Which would be uh, like a badge scanner? I could see that being technical or operational. Like if you have to scan to get into a building. Thank you. Yeah, question. So, um, we had a guy that like had basically uh, Azure popped him up as like an at-risk user because he tried to log in within ten what was it ten times in like five minutes from four different states. Would that be managerial or operational then? Because it was the oversight that triggered a policy that put him in our in our eyes, and then we kind of went back and you know locked him out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just said be good deal. That's exactly why I'm here. <laughs> Managerial is just creating policies to control the technical and operational security controls, right?
Okay. So you're using something like nmap scan or something to look for risks and then blocking the ports, maybe? Okay. All right.
Am I explaining these well enough? Yes. Yeah, maybe maybe if you deploy a uh, a hot site like a redundant site after a disaster, that might be a corrective control. Absolutely. Yep, it, it is a lot to write down. Yeah, um, if you're writing, I mean, I, I'm always a fan of actually writing notes down, but. I am going to make sure I post this uh, this little slide presentation as a resource for you guys in the Discord. <laughs> Just a whole group of people snipping and writing notes furiously. <laughs> yep. Not, not to beat a dead horse, but I mean, security controls are always a classic test question. And they're easy until you see some answers that are really similar, but specific specifically different in these definitions. <laughs> yeah, matches knows this all too well. I mean, even it's weird because on the CompT exams, even the quote-unquote easy questions can get a little bit more convoluted when you see answer choices that are relatively similar to each other. So, yeah, I can ask you a real easy question, but the the difficulty of the question might rely on you know the answers themselves, right? The answer options, which I will give you lots of practice for. If you are new to this class, by the way, typically we do uh, review quizzes, so next Saturday, everything we talk about today is free game. Uh, we will do some competitive review quizzes in Security Plus pretty often. <laughs> All right, and the last three security control categories. A physical control is just that. It physically prevents somebody from entering an area. So alarms, gateways, locks. Um, I have a problem with this definition. Is an alarm going to physically prevent you from entering an area? Maybe. <laughs> Is lighting going to physically prevent you from entering an area? Or would these more be deterrents? Yeah, 300 decibel alarm. If it busts your eardrums, then yes, it's physical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, on the exam, physical security is going to be very specific about preventing physical access. Uh, one term that they don't have here that may pop up, a bollard. If you're not familiar with this stupid word, <laughs> I just typed in the chat, bollard. Remember, a bollard is uh, one of the pillars that prevents a vehicle from going into an area, like concrete or metal pillars. So a bollard is also a specific physical security control. Um, other weird terms? Yeah, the parking pole thing is a bollard. <laughs> or the giant spheres in front of Target are also decorative bollards. Um there you go. Matches read my mind. <laughs> um, 
another weird term, remember a cipher lock. If you see that term cipher lock, that's just a door lock with a number pad on it. Um, a viral, I would not have put alarms and lighting under physical if I were writing a textbook. Let's just say that. Uh, well, typically a cipher lock has like a, a numeric keypad on it. Like traditionally defined, like a doorknob with one through one through nine and zero, you know, that, that kind of keypad. Now a deterrent, a deterrent is something like, like what we talked about earlier, like uh, camera signs posted everywhere. Or uh, like if you drive through your neighborhood, you probably see like house secured by whatever security company. Um, my deterrent in my house is a 80 pound dog that barks at everything in sight. So, I mean, a, a guard dog can be a deterrent, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. It was, uh, matches just put a picture of a cipher lock into the chat. Yeah, unless your dog bites. Um, so when, when my dog is barking, it's a deterrent. When my dog attacks somebody trying to deliver an Amazon package, that's a physical, right? <laughs> that's a physical deterrent. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Would a deterrent, that's not like a camera or like the lighting or the stuff in the physical section? Uh, I, would cert- I would certainly put alarms, lighting, and cameras as deterrents. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Wanna... Okay. Thank you. I mean, realistically, um, it's one of the reasons I install motion sensor lights. You know, the, the lights won't stop somebody from breaking into my house, but statistically, it does lower your risk. If someone is trying to pick a soft target to break into, uh, they're not going to choose the house with a barking dog with floodlights that are motion activated. Those are heavy deterrents. Good question. So cameras would be detective and deterrent. Absolutely. They could be either one. The test won't make you choose between deterrent and detective because they're both. Yeah, even fake cameras. Absolutely. And a, and a compensating control. So compensating control is another odd one. It's kind of like uh, kind of like what we just talked about with uh, with the corrective control, kind of weird. But a compensating control serves as a substitute for a principal control. So think about even let's simplify it to your front door, right? Like my front door has a door lock on the knob itself, but there's also a compensating control that's a big steel deadbolt. So my front door locks like the doorknob locks, but there's also a compensating control that is a substitute for that for that lock, a heavier duty lock on the front door. Now, I like the fact that it says affords the same or better levels of protection. And there's a lot of crap we're going to see in this class that it, it could, could be a compensating control. Like, should you have antivirus running on every computer in your environment? Yes. Are you going to have antivirus running on the servers that they're connecting to as well? Yes. Are you going to have file integrity monitors and web application firewalls stacked on those as well? Yes. And when we talk, especially when we hit the, the, the defense in depth kind of chapter, you're going to see compensating controls are a norm in a in a really secure environment. Only McAfee. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about antivirus later. <laughs> I have a lot of opinions on antivirus, and I have a opinion on personal computers, and then I have an opinion for for enterprise level. Like I would never use Symantec or, or Norton on my computer, but they have some pretty awesome enterprise level stuff. Um, so we'll talk about that in time. <laughs> I hope I'm not going too fast. I hope I'm giving us adequate time to take some, some solid notes. Um, we have not looked at a screen yet that did not have a possible test question on it. Just, just being 
honest. A lot of possible exam questions in this section. Penguin. Oh, I forgot about our penguin code word. <laughs> All right, it's already 11.08 my time. Um, would we like a short break? A, a short coffee break? Can you say the uh, penguins yeah. again? Uh, yeah, so uh, if, if you see penguins mentioned on any topic, that is not a way for us to identify a specific test question. Definitely not a specific identifier. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we did have penguins on our subnetting labs, didn't we? All right, let's go ahead and take an 11-minute and 44-second break, and then we'll move on to some more fun topics. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure who that is, but it sounds like somebody's uh, snoring or sleep talking. It's the TRQ Discord. Ah. I have a quick question. Um, I I just kind of got here um, in the middle of it. So is it appropriate for us to, like, whenever we have a question, to unmute ourselves and ask it? Or should we specifically put it in chat? Both. Uh, he's down for both. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Okay, Thanks. I just didn't want to uh, disrupt the class because I had a question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chaotic in here. Oh, I ask a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> Understood. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
would you mute TRQ? Mm. And just right click or Mad Instructor, you can just right click and mute him. Mm. Yeah, he's I think he might be sleeping. Mm. <laughs> That's the sleep talker, okay. I was wondering who that was. I mean, if you don't mute him, he'll probably tell us in a minute whether or not we should. He's going to be wondering about why he had dreams telling people to mute him. Hey, uh, PMI, you still there? You can just right click and then server mute, and then they can, or I think there's a way you can do it too, or just a regular mute option um, that they would be able to unmute themselves too afterward, you know, if he does wake up. Yeah, it's just a simple mute, unless it's they updated it. Make it, make I'll leave myself a mute nap and time and try it on me. Drag him to the VC. It's <laughs> a good option. Uh, by the way, that binary timer thing, I think it's hilarious. Um, how did you get that? Or at least just what can I search on Google in order to find it? Yeah. Oh, okay. I never used Microsoft Store. One sec.
Beautiful. Not everyone can say that they pass the exam in their sleep. Very nice of you. Starts the second YouTube channel. Sleeping in class. <laughs> Hey, yeah, Sean, you there? Uh, you gonna maybe have a few minutes after class to chat? Okay, gotcha. I didn't want to clog up the other main channel here, but something more localized, if you will. All righty, thanks. All right, go ahead and throw an emoji in the chat if you are back and awake and ready to take notes. All right, so we just wrapped up our security control categories, guaranteed test questions. Another ISO or another standardized framework is the ISO framework. This is another acronym that has a lot of meetings. Um, it's not an ISO file that you've downloaded. Anybody, anybody ever use ISO files for like a system image for a VM? Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Different ISO. Different ISO. Which weird? It's ISO, International Organization for Standards. Maybe they didn't want to do IOS because that's already two different things. I don't know. Hmm. But the ISO standards are kind of like NIST. You're going to see those kind of aligned to a lot of different technologies. However, in Security Plus, on your objective list, you'll see ISO 27K and 31K. Now, I believe that the exam is only going to ask you to differentiate between 27K and 31K. But these are individually placed on the objective list. So, that being said, 27K, in a nutshell, right, is your general security best practices. And I, I remember... Uh, when I used to teach this at a college, that was the only notes we had. 27K was your continual improvement for general information security management. If you look at the details of like 27001 versus 002, 002 just kind of says, hey, this is a bit more specific application of 001. There, there's not, it's a, it's a lot of verbiage, there's not a whole lot of notes to take. 
27K is your general best practices for information security. Period. 27701 goes into a bit more specifics, and maybe it's worthwhile to take a note about, hey, 27701 specifies privacy information management systems. By definition, it's just an extension of 27K. So if I were taking notes, 27K is your basic information security management system best practices. 27701 is your privacy information management specifics of that. One more time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, definitely a penguin. Um, so the 27K, 27,000 ISO standard, right? The 27,000 is just your fundamental information security management standards. For some reason on the objective list, they isolate these four specifically. I don't think they're going to, you're going to get questions on specifically 27701, but it is on the objective list, so I can't say for sure that you won't get a question on it. But 27701 specifies that privacy information management system as an extension of your basic 27K. Uh, yeah, get a penguin in former classes was... Uh, is our way of saying, hey, this might be directly on the test. Because I can't give you exact test questions, because that would be immoral. I think we had a lot of penguins in our uh, submitting chapter. <laughs> and the 31,000 is Enterprise Risk Management. If they're asking for a standard that revolves around risk management, I'm willing to bet the exam is going to mention it as enterprise risk management. So in a nutshell, the ISO standards 27,000 or 27K is going to be your basic information security management standards. 31,000 or 31K specifically is enterprise risk management. Yeah, Buck, there's a truck ton of ISO standards. <laughs> there's a lot of them. Thankfully, we don't have to memorize them. Um, I know I've talked to a few of you guys. I'm currently studying for my CISSP. I, on the on the Quizlet flashcard set we had, uh, I have a few CISSP flashcard sets that get a bit more savage in memorizing standards for ISO and NIST. But don't overstudy for Security Plus. Are we ready to move on? Yes. No, hang, hang on just a minute, Sean. Sure, yeah, no problem, no problem. I know a few people said they're still taking notes, which is good. I appreciate that. Now is a good time if anybody has any questions to throw out there. I'm going to open up my next Diet Coke. Sorry if that was obnoxiously loud. <laughs> This episode sponsored by Diet Coke. Man, if, if Diet Coke sponsored me, I'd be a millionaire right now. <laughs> Before we continue this lesson, let us mention our sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> I don't know who was talking right there, but what a great announcer voice. That, that was really solid. Right. Let's just say I have practice doing that in uh, voice chats and games. And then getting raged at. 
<laughs> which I deserve. Actually, that's that's where I drink Coke Zero. It's not really Diet Coke. Uh, CBIG said there's a free CISSP class somewhere. Hey, throw the throw the link in our general Discord. That, that'll be a good resource. So, sorry, I never heard CISSP. What is that? It's a monster. <laughs> it's a bit. Very a bit. <laughs> That's that uh, I want six figure income test. Or so, like, what that. does it focus on? Um, everything. <laughs> it's, um, it, 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 it's kind of like a big. It's a, it's kind of like Security Plus on steroids, but it's it's more uh-huh. so it's more so meant for like the IT management or the CISO level. <laughs> so there's a lot of legal terms in – um. You know, NIST versus ISO alignment standards that you really have to understand for CISSP. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Mine, uh, I'll definitely dad, look at that. His dad no. just retired. And he had a CISSP whatever. And um, he talked the, uh, about like, the nightmares of what you have to do in this job on the government side of it. <laughs> Hey, that one, the uh, the CISSP, that one's the one you have to have a minimum of like uh, four years of experience in like security first, right? Or yes. is that something else? Okay. Yeah, you have to pass the exam. And then at, when you pass the exam, you have your associate CISSP. But then you have to submit a, a package to actually be approved to be a CISSP. Uh, so you, uh, have, you have to have five years of, of some type of security experience. Yeah. Oh, CISSP is definitely not entry level. Mm-hmm. All right, I think we're ready to move on. Hey, more acronyms. So the Cloud Security Alliance. So the Cloud Security Alliance is basically like it, it, it's a nonprofit organization meant to help CSPs, cloud service providers. So it's it's kind of like a, a a nonprofit that offers best practices for CSPs, but then there's also a lot of a lot of free tools that cloud service providers can use if they're planning on like building an enterprise level cloud architecture or something like that. Um, so again, the acronyms are starting to get weird, right? You have CSP, cloud service provider, cloud security alliance is the nonprofit that helps cloud service providers. This is one of those topics, too, where it might get mentioned once or twice in Security Plus. But you can go research CSA and go 20 pages deep down the rabbit hole if you want to. Um, Just not what I would suggest doing for Security Plus. Just know who CSA is and their main function. Now, the acronym that every single one of my classes has always hated, SSAE, Statements on Standards for Attestation Engagements. Fancy acronym, right? So, to make this simple, here's the technical definition. They're auditors. And if you're taking notes, my advice is, SSAE, when you see this, they're the people who audit cloud service providers to make sure that they're they're functioning morally. You, uh, again, warning, do not go deep down this rabbit hole. The very select few times that you're going to see SSAE on your Security Plus, if you know that those are the auditors for cloud service providers, you really can't jack that question up. This is also another one that you could skydive down the rabbit hole. So here's the technical definition. Yep. Here's my caveman brain definition. Hey, SSAE, they audit cloud service providers. I'm not purposely trying to oversimplify this, but I am. Because that's the level you're going to see on Security Plus. Now, that being said... Exception. Under the SSAE, you have SSAE SOCs, or SOCs, 
service organization control audit types. You might encounter these terms on your exam. And we're going to make them real easy. So one, you might just see SOC audit, quote SOC audit or SOC report, or you might see SSAE SOC all as one big ass annoying acronym. <laughs> just a heads up there. SOC 2 versus SOC 3. Yes, I mean, you'll encounter these in the real world too, but the simplest way is to, to differentiate these two, right? A SOC 2 report has a lot more detail. So if, if your environment is responsible for a SOC audit where you're, uh, you're, you're submitting evidence for whatever financial issues your company uses, right? The SOC 2 will have a lot more of your actual functional details. So SOC 2, more details on an SSAE audit. SOC 3 is your generalized public view. So think of the SOC 3 as, um, hey, SOC 3, we can publicly advertise that we did a SOC audit. So SOC 2 has all of your functional details reports, details of the report. SOC 3, generic, generic and basic. Are there any other um, organizations other than the uh, SSAE that can do SOC audits, or is that the only one? Um, I don't like to use definite terms. Well, let's just say for Security Plus, they will they will limit it to SSAE. Okay, thanks. In, in reality, I'm like, oh, that's not true. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, let, let's uh, for, for Security Plus, let, let's connect those two. I think it's a good idea. No, no, no. SOC, a CVE is more so identifying specific vulnerabilities, right? Remember, these are these are audit reports. One, uh, we'll, we'll go back to SOC 2. Yeah, SOC 2 is more specific on those, on those SSAE audits. Like, the SOC 2 has all your actual details of your environment. SOC 3 is like the public view of that. Very generic. And basically it's like, hey, the SOC 3, we did an audit. Hey, hey, public, we did an audit. If it were my choice, I wouldn't have even brought these up, but I know for a fact you can get a question that wants you to know that SOC 2 has all of your actual specifics data. Eh, see how that works? <laughs> this really is a hard topic to not go in detail on, but again, remember, we're, we're, we're flying as close as we legally can to the exam, right? Unless you guys want a bunch more information. I did warn you, the topics today are not exciting, right? Well, they're just interesting. That's it. I'm like, kind of going depth on the road with the whole job. Yeah, in my mind, I'm like, I'm thinking like, man, th this is the boring stuff we have to get through for, for the exam. The, the, the fun stuff is coming in security. <laughs> but these are free points. Uh, we, we can't be losing 50, 60, 70 points because of these stupid acronyms or the the legal terms. Ooh. Ooh. There, there's your SOC 3 overview. If you're writing notes, remember SSA SOC 3 is your generic public view of this audit. Less detailed than SOC 2. That's the only notes I would take personally. Oh, look, it even says that wherever I borrowed this from. Not as much detail. Oh, look. Typically used by the organization as a marketing tool. Hey, I'm glad this screenshot agreed with me. <laughs> wow. 
I, I got to get something right. You got you guys won't let me live down that five nines mistake from the beginning. <laughs> Now I want to post this video and like the first comment's going to be like, you dumbass, that 5-9 statement wasn't right. <laughs> Sorry. I Cut it out and pretend it didn't happen. I blame, uh, I'm not going to, editing's a lot of work, man. I'll just take the heat. <laughs> I blame the coffee. All right, another group, the CIS, the Center for Internet Security. So... I brought this screenshot up specifically because this nonprofit organization is specifically known for their benchmarks. Uh, has anybody used a benchmark before? Or can someone define this term benchmark? So we're all on the same page. Cinebench? <laughs> yeah, like Cinebench, 3D Mark, Unigen Heaven. Memtest 86. Like, Memtest 86, if you want to go classic. Um, so we're, we're naming names of softwares, but what does it do? Someone tell me what it does. In, uh, in... A benchmark is a view of a system, uh, usually how it um, how it's operating and just generally its usage that defines what is normal for that system. Yeah, so, and like Cinemark or 3D Mark or Unigen Heaven, what we did, all the ones we just named. Like Cinemark's going to be testing basically your processor heavy or graphics capable output, right? Um, a lot of classic like benchmark programs, gamers download to to basically push their graphics card to its maximum capacity, right? It's testing the capability or capability capabilities uh, of something. Now, the CIS benchmarks, they're not going to have a bunch of graphics card benchmarks, but their website has a lot of free open source tools if you want to run a benchmark on your environment. Maybe like kind of like a vulnerability scanner. So these benchmarks are kind of open source free tools to create a baseline and get better standards of what is, like someone said, normal in your environment. Do you need to mentally connect CIS, Center for Internet Security, with their standard of benchmarks list? Possibly. The next major uh, group that we need to talk about, OWASP. So OWASP is a big one, and this is one that you're going to encounter. So the Open Worldwide Application Security Project, OWASP, they're a nonprofit group, but more functionally what they give us on the security side, something that I look at probably every day, is our OWASP Top 10. And this is a functional, useful, monster tool in the security world. So they publish these top 10 list of vulnerabilities. Like the, the, you know, we refer to it as the OWASP top 10. There's also an API OWASP top 10 that we'll, we'll talk about APIs later. Um, is, yeah, we'll, we'll get into APIs later. That's a nightmare topic. But OWASP top 10. In 2021, 2022, the top 10 biggest vulnerabilities found across the board so a lot of your uh, a lot of the systems that we're going to talk about like vulnerability scanners um it, we'll talk about this a little later but a lot of the times when they find a vulnerability it's even labeled like owas top 10 or owas 5 so the owas top 10 is your list of top 10 vulnerabilities across the board found in many environments. <clears throat> I will definitely screenshot that. Not, not now before it's a good idea, but they're not going to ask you like, what is OWASP six? They're not going to ask you specific numbers. So 
you don't have to memorize this. But when you go to work in a cybersecurity environment, you will see these every single day. Yeah. And for example, you guys know that I work for a financial institution, a payment processor um, here in Fort Worth. Like OWA 6 is something I should never, ever see on any report that comes across my screen. Outdated components is not something that's allowed in the PCI world. You can't have outdated end-of-life operating systems. You can't have outdated anything in my environment. Um, it's not the case for every environment, though. So is it the top 10 most destructive vulnerabilities or the top 10 most occurring vulnerabilities? Probably, I won't say the most occurring, but the, the most at risk. I think is, is a more accurate way to, to, to find those. For example, the, and you could say the most possibly destructive, but if you have a bunch of broken access control errors and warnings in your environment, that's bad. That's very bad. That means someone can access information that shouldn't be able to access it. Now, a, a, a lot of you guys are bringing up that term that we talked about in NetPlus, CVE, which we'll talk about today. But remember, a CVE identifies a specific vulnerability by number, right? These, these might include CVEs. So if there's, a, if there's a new, brand new vulnerability that comes out that takes advantage of, like, weak cryptography, or like a specific cryptographic function, it might fall under OWASP 2, but it, that CVE will have CVE dash the year it was released dash the specific identifying number, which actually is at the end of this presentation. So think of a CVE as a specific vulnerability that will fall under a top 10 larger vulnerability. Am I explaining that well enough or do I have any questions on that? Yeah, well, the thing is, um, it's not always going to fall under one of the top 10 because that's just simply top 10. CV deals with all discovered vulnerabilities. True, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point, yeah. I mean, uh, last week I got a list of new CVEs, and it was like 800 deep. I mean, they didn't all fall under the top 10. Some of them were just really weird off-the-wall stuff that is not in my environment anyway. So that, that is a very good point. Not every vulnerability falls under one of these 10. Remember, this is just the top 10. And those aren't specific. Those are just like categories, the top 10 like categories. Of... Yeah, yep. Well, there's a topic we have to get into later in this, this class. Request forgery issues. All right, that'll be fun. But OWASP top 10, your top 10 categories of vulnerabilities. Uh, Matches, how do I get this report specifically or the actual vulnerabilities report? So the actual vulnerabilities come from a lot of different sources. I get vulnerability reports from a, a, a few different kind of um, organizations but I also get more specific vulnerability reports from like our web application firewall vendors and our vulnerability scan vendors. So every platform we have, those vendors produce their own found vulnerabilities that get sent out to the security teams. So, to, you know, there's no easy answer for that. Yeah, CVEs come from multiple places. And, and luckily, like, the, I work in a financial institution, so... Like, I know if I see a CVE on Windows Vista, it doesn't apply to us. I can tell you with authority that we have no Windows Vista PCs anywhere in our environment, um, which might not be the case for every every place, you know. Anybody work somewhere that's rocking Windows Vista still? Or XP, even? I hope yeah, that, um, I don't know if you know about Houston Methodist. Oh, no. Yeah, but we're still rocking no. uh, rockin there. <laughs> uh, a, a hospital? Yeah. 
Oh no. <laughs> oh no. That's oh no. That's not good. Yeah. That's we're not changing good. it. We're changing it. We're trying. Get, get, put it put in a change request today. Yeah, that's uh... <laughs> Hey, well, spe- a lot of things for the um health industry actually, they have to go through like extreme regulations to even get some of the software for the machines, some of the specific health machines. Yeah. And then those companies like either went out of business or stopped supporting it. But the machines aren't getting remade. So, you know, random MRI machines or heart monitors or things that may run on like really old systems or just don't get supported anymore and have to run on those old systems. Oh, there's man. <laughs> hey, speaking of legal issues, if I were a good instructor, I would take every legal or legislative term and put it on one slide, color-coded. Um, again, if I were writing a book, I would just have these all on one page. These are right off the objective list. So, yes, we need to know these. First of all, your socks or Sarbanes-Oxley. So, this piece of legislation focuses on Practices and keeping financial records. So this is basically, hey, this mandates how you actually maintain and store financial data. Any company that is public has to have specific reporting on their financial data, and that's what SOX is, financial reporting. Yeah, only to listed companies, yep. Now, the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, please mentally connect us with the European Union. CompTIA certifications are globally recognized. So in the U.S., we don't really have to deal with specifically this acronym, this this law, but this is basically the European Union's set of laws that govern how data is, is stored and processed. Yes, we have similar laws in the U.S., but it's kind of more siloed into the type of organization compared to uh, just one specific. So I would mentally connect this GDPR with the European Union specifically. All right, the GLBA, if you see this fancy acronym, graham leach Bliley Act, but basically, this is this is the act that determines, hey, how do you safeguard and keep customer information? Like, if you're a company and you're taking in your customer's information, there are specific regulations that you have to abide by. Transferring the data, storing the data, and who you give that data out to. And also ensuring the customer knows how their data will be shared which every company follows to a t right all right oh yeah minty that's a good point a few of these were definitely on a plus too right my favorite pci dss payment card industry data security standards this is half of my life. <laughs> so PCI DSS, if, if your company is taking credit cards, PCI is all the rules revolving around how those data connections are encrypted and protected and stored and logged and monitored. All of that falls under PCI DSS. Um, Weirdly enough, it, it's the same term in A+, but A+, and Net+, more so just say PCI. Security+, Plus gets more specific with PCI DSS. Same thing. Same thing. PCI standards, PCI DSS standards, there, there's no difference. Yep, and, of course, this last one, HIPAA, protects your PHI, right? Your protected healthcare information. I would note that PHI is defined by CompTIA exams as government regulated. 
in the U.S. Hey, no worries. I'm going to try to get the video uploaded by the uh, the end of this weekend. So hopefully midday tomorrow it, it should be uploaded if all goes well. Are these the most exciting bullet points? No, but you got to know them? Yeah. I promise Security Plus gets way more interesting after today. Just hang in there. No, it doesn't. It just because it's more complicated. But I feel like some of the more complicated bullet points do get a bit more uh, a bit more hands on, where you can go in and actually attack some stuff. <laughs> I think sub fun. I think submitting's fun. What are you talking about? Yeah, something is, is needed, so it's definitely fun. Yeah, even if you don't plan on going into networking specifically, you still need to understand subnetting. Absolutely. Uh, uh, go ahead and throw an emoji in the chat if we're ready to move on. Ready. Yep, subnetting was covered in Net Plus. Yep. You're, you're, uh, that being said, you're not going to get specific subnetting questions on Security Plus. So if you're just attacking Security Plus, you, you don't have to stress about, about attacking subnetting specifically. All right, all right, see you, Wolf. There's a, there's a lot of people in here. I can't tell if we're, the majority of us are overwhelmed or bored. You guys are poker facing me. <laughs> well, we all just listen. Everybody's, everybody's holding aces. No one's Would you rather me turn on my webcam? Hey, can. <laughs> oh, my, my mine won't let me turn on my webcam. Video chat isn't available for more than twenty five users. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know that, but interesting. All right, so easy terms that can be really misleading. So we have to understand these terms, especially how they're defined in Security Plus. Vulnerability versus threat versus risk. Now, I feel like a common misconception is when you say like the threat is raised or like the, the threat level increases. And that's not technically correct in, in Security Plus. So think of it this way. The vulnerability is just that, right? Something that exposes your organization. Um, let's, let's make it even more simple. Let's, let's think about my house. If I were to leave my door unlocked, that's a vulnerability, right? I think we all, we all agree with that, right? Now, leaving my door unlocked does not increase the threat. Let me say that again. Leaving my door unlocked does not increase the threat. The threat is the actual malicious attacker. So the threat is defined as the attacker or, of course, like the incident, like a, a virus or something like that, malware. That is the threat. If I leave my door unlocked, my door unlocked is a vulnerability that increases the risk. The risk is increased if a vulnerability is introduced. So the risk is a likelihood that a threat will execute an attack. This is definitely penguin penguin territory. <laughs> um, I, I'd be real shocked if you didn't see this a few different ways in your exam. 
But do we see what I mean by the threat is the actual attack, whereas more vulnerabilities or larger vulnerabilities raise your risk level? Uh, I just realized on the previous side, like, you know, with the legal definition and stuff, you, mm -hmm. uh, you let out, um, you didn't, um, you didn't mention, uh, FISMA, the Federal Information Security uh, Management Act. Uh, is that on the objective list? I, I might have missed it if it's on the objective list. Um, I don't know it is, um, but... In a uh, previous Security Plus course, uh, it was mentioned to me. Um, there, there's a, also COPPA was mentioned to me as well in uh, that course. Um, but just saying. I, I've never seen those two on a Security Plus, but I will definitely check the objective list. All right. See, if I was writing the objective list, all the legal crap would be in the same section. So we would just know what to study. <laughs> no, I'll double check to make sure I didn't miss one, though. Um, by the way, if this is your first class with me, uh, typically when we roll through these courses, the last day, I call it like the cleanup day. So the last class, I'll roll through the entire objective list and kind of pull out terms that either we didn't hit or we didn't hit hard enough. Um, so just keep in mind, we, we will pick up the, the straggler objectives if, if I do miss something, because I do miss some every now and then. Just a heads up on that. Do I have any questions on these three terms? Because they should be they should be free points, but the verbiage can get kind of evil. Good, great, great, wonderful. Everybody's got aces. Rafa's over there holding the, the ace of squares and the joker card. <laughs> ace of diamonds. Ace of diamonds. Hearts, stars, diamonds, clovers, and balloons. All right. <laughs> My goodness, I'm leaving. <laughs> All right. So, with the, under the basic definitions of attack vectors, right? There's internal and external threats. Now, obviously, external threats come from outside of your organization, right? One key thing here, though, supplier. We're going to talk about supply chain vulnerability here, and that's a, that's becoming a huge attack vector. So, yes, your external threats can include anything from just your basic black hat attackers, or external threats can be because of a poor defense. Like, let's just say my company did not use any kind of web application firewall to protect our websites. Although that is a company policy, I'm creating an external threat by not having that layer of defense, right? Whereas, and my dog is attacking my cats. If you hear that in the background, sorry. <laughs> Internal threats can be everything from software threats to... Uh, to pissed off employees, right? If you remember, so the... I have a question about internal threats. Sure. Um, is an employee an internal threat only when they have the intention of becoming a threat? Because uh, sometimes a vulnerability, um, it, it, sometimes something back can happen unintentionally, uh, like they execute the wrong command, um, and that would be a mistake. But does that would that label who has access an internal threat or the only an internal threat when they become like disgruntled or something? So that's a great question. Um, <laughs> matches. I remember that. No. So there was a big um, topic in one of my books that talked about even untrained employees are inadvertent internal threats. So an internal threat doesn't have to be like it doesn't have to be labeled specifically malicious. I think that's what you were getting at, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be a disgruntled employee. It could be an employee that does damage 
accidentally because they had too many permissions. But both of those would be considered internal threats. <laughs> Matches is, refer is referring to uh, a certain user that was downloading Sega Genesis games on a work laptop. <laughs> um, now, th that user that downloaded Sega Genesis games was not being malicious to the company, but they were certainly an internal threat, whether they knew it or not. Um, yeah, well, we won't get into details on that, but... Uh, yeah, there's the external threat slide that I borrowed somewhere. If this is your slide, uh, please don't sue me. This is a free class. <laughs> oh, Bubba, don't get me started on the fishing tickets. And I had one of those last month. How often those are hit. Yeah. I mean, you get that call from security. Hey, by the way, I need you to go lock this guy out immediately and run to his computer. Well, I mean, like every major company, including ours, we do phishing campaigns against our own employees. Um, just the amount of people that click and open attachments without second thought is terrifying. It, oh, yeah. It really is. <laughs> Our well, security engineer pulled a fast one with a uh, QR code for a free coffee from Starbucks that redirected him to phishing training. <laughs> no, that's wrong. You got to do it to a Rickroll. But anyways, um, isn't there a way for you to set up a system to where if you click on like a malicious link or whatever, it won't do any harm to you uh, so that you get to see where it goes, um, but it doesn't uh, but it doesn't do anything bad? Is there so, a way to set it up? There is, but the, in my experience, the the weird caveat to that is there's a lot of security controls you can apply to your users, but then you run into a truck ton of tickets that in, include like, hey, one of our vendors is trying to send me a valid email, but it keeps getting quarantined. So it's that weird balance between do you allow them to click nothing or do you get 800 tickets because they can't access a spreadsheet sent by a vendor? Um, it's it's a terrible scale balance um, that help desk has to deal with more often than not. So there are ways to really limit the user's functions, but on the security side, you have to gauge how intrusive is this going to be to actual valid work. Um, and there is no right answer for that. It's a constant game of balance. So, yes, you can, but it's really hard to do without preventing the real work from happening. Any technical standards is going to say user training is the best method. Training your users to recognize malicious links or malicious emails or invalid emails. Good question. Oh, virus total is actually in one of these slides coming up. <laughs> yep. Uh, any questions on internal versus external threats? Sorry. Not to get sidetracked, but all those questions definitely directly apply. All right, let's okay. So let's imagine this hypothetical scenario. Let's say somebody um they don't necessarily work for the company, but they have a contract with the company. Uh, like, let's say they're some kind of mechanic or, like, they maintain stuff or um, that kind of thing. So they have access to the building. It's limited access, but they're hired under a third-party vendor to do stuff. So would that make them an internal or external threat? I'd say internal because they have access, but external because they're not part of the organization. Well, in, in the perfect world, and a lot of companies do this, I mean, vendors ha are are – if they, if they need some kind of limited access to the environment, they want to go under their own security group policy. Like a super, super restricted group that has basic access to the network on an as-needed basis. Okay. So, so would that make them an external threat? I mean, they're not part of the company, so I would say they're still external. Unless, unless right. they're walking around your, company, your, your building trying to plug into open Ethernet ports. You know, then all of a sudden, mm, that's a gray area, right? Yep. All right. 
Yep. It really I, I was just wondering. But, I mean, like our contractors, if they're coming into the building, there, there's <laughs> – it's very, uh, very limited even internet access. Um, supply chain uh, threats are an issue. When you put them on a, a subnet, just be peer to peer. They definitely put vendors on their own VLANs. That's that's a good option. Okay. Absolutely. Or don't give them access, the don't VLAN. from the security side. My opinion is don't give them access to the network at all. <laughs> they can use guest Wi-Fi, which is already limited. Uh, there you go. <laughs> All right, so many of you have probably heard these terms, black hat, gray hat, white hat. That's the Cleveland. <laughs> What's that? Did someone say Cleveland? No, Penguin. Oh, Penguin, yeah, definitely a Penguin. Um, so by definition, a white hat hacker is an ethical hacker. They're hacking for good reasons. They're hacking in order to improve the security posture of a company. Now, this term white hat is becoming quickly um, not as accepted. So white hat can also be called authorized hacker. Although these hat colors have nothing to do with race, a lot of standardized governing bodies are trying to completely sidestep any, uh, any negative connotations. So a white hat is also called an authorized or ethical hacker. A gray hat, or semi-authorized, is still not malicious. Now, here's the weird thing. Um, I always define a gray hat as someone who hacks for good in, with good intentions, but not always with permission or not always using moral methods. So that would be someone like a hacktivist. Well, a hacktivist is typically still trying to be malicious to the target, at least. Um, so, I mean, there's a huge uh, gray area there, right? But if someone is hacking for good intentions, even if they're using illegal methods, they're still a gray hat if they have good intentions. That's very different from a black hat who is specifically attacking. So a black hat hacker is attacking to do damage or some negative effect. The test. What if. Oh, good. I was just going to ask, what if that's with the intention of, like, you have good intentions, but you're doing bad things, like people that uh, blackmail scammers or hack into, you know, random call center in India and stuff like that. Would that be under the black hat because it's an attack or gray hat because they're doing something good, but they're doing something bad? Well, in that case, I would call them a gray hat hacker. The scammers that they're attacking would probably call them black hats. <laughs> So I, I think it's a point of view, really. Um, yeah, then we get into the whole thing is, is it moral to attack people who are bad by def definition anyway? And uh, don't, don't, don't go too deep down the rabbit hole on that one. <laughs> My only thing is, be careful. Unauthorized is a black hat. Authorized is a white hat. Semi-authorized is gray hat. So some synonyms to connect there. Um, also, fair warning, Red Hat is not a hacker. That is an operating system. So don't fall victim to a bait answer like Red Hat when asked about hackers. Although hackers might use Red Hat, or they'll use Cali, but a Red Hat is not a hacker. A Red Hat is an operating system. Not to be confused with red team, blue team. <laughs> yeah, that's penetration test. Yeah. How hats became the way to differentiate them? Uh, I So historically, I read somewhere that these terms were created because in old Western movies, like old black and white movies, all the bad Western guys had black cowboy hats on. All the good guys had white hats to differentiate them. In old and the bad guys always look cooler. Yeah, in old westerns. I'm not sure how much truth there is behind that, but I've read that in a few different places. Um, 
Whether it's true or not, who knows? Don't quote me on that. Okay, Boomer. Get out of here. <laughs> How old do you think I am? All right. A script kitty is an actual technical term. So a script kitty is someone who buys or downloads malware that they didn't design themselves. Typically, um, a script kitty is going to be defined as a lower skill level, but that doesn't exactly make them less dangerous, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, you know, I can't, I can't write a zero-day, really savage Trojan just with, a, with an open compiler. I'm not that good. I can do basic programming. Um, but if I spend ten grand and go buy a really savage piece of malware, is that does that make me less dangerous? I would argue mm. that it does make you less dangerous because you don't have you don't necessarily have the skills in order to continue the attack if something goes wrong. Uh, also, they're incapable of doing any any like zero day attacks and. Um, and if you do proper patch management, a lot of the scripts that they run uh, rely on vulnerabilities that are unpatched. So I'd say a script kitty is like the lowest vulnerability. Uh, I mean, the lowest, um, no, not vulnerability, the lowest threat. Um, I mean, on the technical, actual like, malware side, I agree with that. Um, I, I think that the test might isolate the fact that just because they're the lowest skill level, you can't dismiss them from not being dangerous. I think that would be the, the general idea on a CompTIA exam. Uh, okay. I see where you're coming from. I understand. Yeah. Thank you. And, of course, well, and you're right on the software side, but then I'm just thinking of all these basic attacks that have huge, huge effects. Uh, has anybody watched Linus Tech Tips in the last two weeks? Oh, yeah. You got that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've heard about it. Didn't somebody um, like they hired that had account access? They got um, it, there was a spear phishing um, attack, and so they uh, handed over the accounts and stuff, and so that he lost access to his YouTube channels. Well, I mean, yeah, Linus, one of, Linus said that one of his employees basically clicked on a, an email attachment that was supposed to be a PDF, and all of a sudden, three a.m., the whole channel's down. Everything's deleted. Chaos. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, you're right in the fact that a script kitty is less dangerous on the the technical execution of the code. But, man, a lot of the big attacks aren't that detailed, man. Like, a, a lot of the craziest attacks, when you look at the actual attack vector and how it started, you're like, wow. I can't believe that was that simple. <laughs> Um, the, the, what's it called? The, the, the gas pipeline on the East coast. What was that company called? I don't remember where the East coast of the U S had a, had a huge, uh, outage of functionality for a while. Oh, I Keystone, no, not Keystone. I don't remember what the name of it was, but again, basic phishing attack. It started off as a basic phishing attack and dropped the whole East coast supply chain for, for gas. Um. Yeah. Or oh, Google turning off their DNS servers. Oh, uh, Colonial Pipeline. That's what it was. Colonial Pipeline. Yeah. You would think that that was a really advanced, like state actor level attack. It, that's not how it started. It started as something real basic. Did somebody mention Hanada in the chat? Did I see Hanada? Oh man, symmetry. Uh, I think I put Hinata in the end of this, uh, this presentation, actually. New DDoS attack. We'll get there, though. How about some easy terms? A hacktivist is a hacker with political or social or religious or racial or whatever other social stuff they want to hack for. So if someone's hacking for one of these reasons, by definition, they're labeled a hacktivist. I'm... If you keep that term in mind, I don't think you can miss any CompTIA test questions revolving around that term, hacktivist. Pretty straightforward, yeah? Crickets. 
Oh, actually, I just um, I just thought of the uh, situation. So let's say there's like a terrorist organization, and so they have certain religious beliefs, and so you know they start hacking, but like you know they're well funded. Would that be considered organized crime, or would that be considered hacktivist, or well, would that just simply be considered an advanced persistent threat? Well, not an APT, not not unless they keep hold of an environment, right? But th don't think of it as or. I mean, they could be script kiddies and hacktivists and state actors and a crime syndicate. Oh, they, they, they could be they could be labeled as all of them. Um, I, I never thought of it that way. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, on the exam, they're not going to make you choose if it falls under multiple categories. Then that's why the, the CompT exams have to be really specific on these terms, because, you know, if a country is religiously motivated and they're hacking, but they're also state funded, they're, they're going to be both by definition. Okay, thanks. I never, I never uh, considered that they could be multiple. Yeah, and uh, a lot of you will find that the Security Plus exam. I mean, it's a lot of technical detail. A lot of the verbiage is half the fight, though. I mean, for those of you that have taken CompT exams, you, you know that the verbiage is. <laughs> and the chat's talking about Amish hackers now. All right, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. You guys saw something shiny and ran with it. <laughs> a crime Syndicate is literally just that. Um, it, 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 for some reason, they changed the name. It used to be Organized Crime, but Organized Crime or Crime Syndicate, they're groups that pool their resources for more advanced attacks, whether it's financial or just to do damage for some reason. Again, a Crime Syndicate could be socially motivated. They could be both. I like how, uh, you know, when we say state actor, we're, I'm automatically thinking Russia or North Korea or China, right? Like, you don't think the U.S. has some state actors too? <laughs> like, <laughs> every major company, I think every major country has their own state actors. Um, it just depends on which news resource you're looking for, right? <laughs> But state actors are just that. They are state funded. Typically, much much better funded than most crime syndicates, unless they're both. The uh, Marine Corps cybersecurity team has a lot of really cool posts that they put up on LinkedIn about their, uh, their setups and what they do. If anybody is interested in that one. That's awesome. Yeah, I I'm not one of those Americans that's going to pretend like we do every day morally, because... Uh, well, I've read history books, so I don't think any country is 100% moral. But state actors are state-funded. Pretty straightforward. Vatican City probably doesn't have them. Right. <laughs> oh, wait. Was Definitely that, not. What was that? They got a lot of gold to pay for it. I was, like, was that sarcasm or... <laughs> isn't, Vatican, isn't Vatican City, like, kind of considered a country? Uh-huh. And their own bank at the same time. And their own religion. Man, they're hitting a lot of they're hitting a lot of CompTIA bullet points. <laughs> uh, I'm not I'm not touching this topic with a stick. I would assume any any well funded state has their own set of state actors. All right, moving on before we start talking about the Amish again. Um, <laughs> this term APT. I, I, it comes up a, a lot in in CompTIA everything, but an advanced persistent threat is especially dangerous. And an APT is defined as an attack that has long-term connectivity. So it's dangerous if your company gets hacked. It is really dangerous if you discover you got hacked six months ago and you're just now finding out about it. Um, that is exponentially worse when you're start, you, you basically have to triage and try to figure out what data or what was actually exposed over a time period. So, especially on technical exams, not just CompTIA, this term APT, when you see this, it's going to insinuate that the attack 
is over a time period. And that is a huge variable. An advanced persistent threat is like, hey, I'm a security analyst and I just found an attack that was successful in 2019. And we have no record of it. That would be really bad. This is kind of an important one. Am I am I explaining this well enough? So let yeah. me get this straight. Someone is not an APT unless if they actually successfully did an attack. I thought an APT was someone who was constantly trying to get in. No. Um, but, it, but it's only an APT if they did an attack? Yeah, so an APT means that someone was able to actually successfully execute an attack, and it basically went undetected. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, like I mean, like, Thank like, you. like, for example, obviously I work in a financial institution. We have certain regions and countries that are attacking like 3,000 times a day. None of them ever get through. But those countries, Russia, <laughs> those are not advanced persistent threats because they never got in. It'd be like 300,000 attacks and 300,000 attacks were blocked this month. It's pretty, pretty blatantly blocked. But if one gets in, it's dangerous. Um, I know a few years ago I got a letter from the VA saying that we we discovered an attack that happened X number of months ago and your data may have been exposed. Does anybody remember that? I think that was 2016. If you're a veteran, you might have gotten the same letter. But the Veterans Affairs Office discovered that they were attacked and no one no one knew about it for months and months and months. Am I explaining this well enough? Yes, thank you. I need to break out my cricket soundboard. What happened afterwards? Who knows? They, just, they sound a little like, hey, your information may have been leaked, sorry. <laughs> it all got listed on a site that was 18 random characters as the URL somewhere. Right, somewhere. Don't worry, we'll, we'll look at Have I Been Pwned today. <laughs> if you've been to that website all right another important term shadow it now when you see this term on the exam which you will oh sorry oh, penguins 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 shadow it shadow it just means any it infrastructure hardware or software that is not implemented by the IT team that is not approved by the IT professionals in an environment. So if a user brings their own printer in or if they install a, a software package that was not authorized, or if your developers create 800 APIs and security doesn't know about it, <laughs> that could even be shadow IT. So shadow IT is hardware or software that is not authorized by the appropriate IT teams. Oh man, don't get me started on like browser extensions. I mean, yeah, like like video games on a work laptop is terrible, but then you get to the more tedious things like, hey, you know what? We need to run an audit. We need to have a list of approved browser extensions because looking at the monster list of CVEs, some of them are associated with Google Chrome browser extensions. USB policies. I think, you, I think the gears are turning now, right? Think of all the things that may be in an environment that may not be specifically authorized. Anybody have uh, any, any first-hand experience on some shadow IT that's shocking? Oh, yeah. Grammarly. <laughs> Grammarly, yeah. Yeah, we learned that uh, through the Grammarly user policy, anything that you type is sent and recorded to their databases. <laughs> so if you're thinking about, like, as far as, like, okay, if you work in a financial sector and you're typing up an email to somebody that has confidential information, that's stored on their servers now. Oh. Dang. <laughs> that, that. That's a PCI <laughs> violation. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to get into, like, regulations, that's something, yeah, uh, watch out for that. 
Those Although it's great for your, you know, cool. college classes and writing up uh, essays. Day one of security and half the class decides they don't want to go into security anymore. <laughs> Are you sure you want to go into cybersecurity, everybody? Um, oh, wow. No, it's a great field. I'm just kidding. But that 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 those are things you have to think about. Uh, symmetry just brought up in the chat. Bring your own device and mobile device management. Um, when I worked for CompTIA, we weren't allowed to use Android devices on on the headquarters network. Does anybody know why that is? Why all the managers? All, because all, they got paid by Apple. What? <laughs> yeah, that was the only time I ever actually had an iPhone that I used because um, I had to. Well, we know we know Android is a Linux distribution, right? A- Android operating systems can be so is so is iOS. Yeah, it's like a Disney a Disney version of, of a Linux, so it's super popular. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, I mean it, it is Unix based, right? But iOS a- Apple devices are way easier to lock down on on a network than Android devices are. Um, so. All, all the things you guys are putting in chat, I think you guys are starting to think about what can fall under shadow IT. And it's a lot. A user might not think bringing their own printer to work is bad. A user is not, a, a user, I have an example. A user is not going to consider the pivoting attacks that come with an extra printer and what ports have to be open. Um, what, what's your example? Um, and so I work for uh, my school's IT department, and so uh, well, my school district's IT department, and so someone put in a ticket saying that their projector was dim, uh, and they needed a, a bulb to be replaced. However, it was a projector that they got with their own money, and so we did not have the uh, we could not get the model of bulb that we need for the projector, uh, and so inadvertently, um, they uh. They made it to where we couldn't support them because it wasn't one of our projectors. Uh, so, mm. it's not really a security thing, but it's still shadow IT. It's still shadow IT. Uh, was that projector on the network? No, it wasn't on a network or anything. It's just that we couldn't get a bulb for it. Oh, okay. It's like if that's a network device projector, that's surely a security thing. <laughs> but yeah. although there are some. I've heard of some um, teachers getting their own printers and, like, you know, connected to the network and that stuff, and that is a serious problem. That's a bad problem. So, so many pivoting attacks can can be executed through printers. That's a, that's an issue. Absolutely. So, when you see this term "shadow IT" on the exam, keep that definition in mind. Hey, you guys should be proud of me. This whole time, I didn't even bring up IoT devices, and I really wanted to. <laughs> oh, there you go, Viral. You brought it up. We're going to talk about IoT. What do you mean? They're the most secure devices you could ever have on your network. Yeah, if you believe that, I'm 120 pounds. <laughs> 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 Spoiler, I'm not. Um, but <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about IoT and um, how IoT devices exponentially increase your attack surface later. Um, there's some fun some fun case studies in that conversation. But let's get to the boring stuff first, the fundamentals on day one. So your attack surface, this term, is just that. It's any point where someone can get in your network. All right, we have to talk about it. How many people have smart devices on their network? Smart light bulb, smart thermostat, a vacuum cleaner that sends you text messages, Something crazy. If you got, if you get Bluetooth connectivity to your microwave, <laughs> they're not all insecure. Okay, first of all, I want to say that they're not all insecure. Um, but when we get to that chapter or that section, there are a lot of case studies where big environments got absolutely train wrecked from unsecure smart devices. Because every time you add a device, even a smart light bulb, it increases your attack surface. Uh, I, I think it was A+. I told you guys the story about when I was in London. CompTIA sent me to London years ago. Uh, what, and London has a lot of casinos. But one case that comes up is uh, one of the casinos got hacked and their, their high roller credit card list got stolen. 
threw a thermometer in the fish tank in the lobby. Yeah, the, the, they wanted the fish tank to be network connected so they could monitor the temperature, keep the fishes safe um, remotely. But somebody somehow figured out a way to get through that through that thermometer into the network. Um, that situation really yeah. heated up. <laughs> See what you did there. But we'll talk about IoT devices later and how they really uh, they can be really damaging to your attack surface. Now, I promised earlier, supply chain attacks, right? So supply chain attacks are obviously increasing, and this is actually an old statistic. I know the numbers are higher now. Who remembers, what, what year was that? Not to be too old. 2014, when Target got hacked? Like around Christmas time, does anybody remember that? I heard about it. Uh, didn't they? Um, wasn't there like something in the HMAC, uh, the HVAC system, um, where there was like, I forgot. Never mind. No, no, you're absolutely right. No, so Target, ultimately Target got compromised, and somebody stole a lot of Target customer credit cards. But Target wasn't directly attacked, or they weren't hacked directly. The HVAC company that they had contracts with, who they let into the network, were compromised. So an attacker actually was able to execute an attack on the HVAC company, and they basically let the HVAC company carry that malware into Target. This is becoming a huge problem because, one, it's really hard to enforce security policies on a vendor. It's very difficult. It's hard to monitor, hard to control. Um, now, I have a few family members that are relatively high up in government contractor companies, not to name any of them, but even when they're buying keyboards and mice, right? So company X gets a shipment of keyboards and mice in. The users cannot use those keyboards and those mice, the Bluetooth keyboards and mice, or sorry, USB, until they're actually sent to security and security runs a proprietary scan. New out of the box. Simply because you don't know if somebody was able to load malware onto those USB devices. <laughs> so um, friend just literally just takes me a month. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I just heard about this. Um, so some places you might go to work and they might, they might be really relaxed on their USB policies or their, their supply chain anythings. If you're going to work for a government contractor like Boeing or Raytheon or Lockheed Martin, you're going you should expect to have some really stringent rules on supply chain and USB devices. Your keyboard software was detected as a Trojan? Was it downloaded from the manufacturer or from a random GitHub? <laughs> Kind of what uh, Advils was saying. I'm not sure if he had a razor or not, but Info6 said we weren't allowed to use razor devices because it basically gave you a guaranteed backdoor if you downloaded their software. Ooh, dirty. So, yeah, any razor devices were automatically disqualified. That's savage. I mean, I use Razer Master Keyboard, but I don't download their software. I'm good, yeah, with, me. The, I'm good with the Windows drivers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, what time is it? I know this. I feel like I've just been ranting. Do we need a quick break? Well, we don't have much longer to go. What are we doing again? Is it again? So I, I, I know we kind of uh, ran long on this section. Do we? Do we need to take a quick five minute break? Sorry, guys. I was a uh, super caffeinated. Lost track of time. We'll, we'll take a, a six minute and 56 second break. How about that? And then we'll, then we'll wrap up today's uh, lesson.
All right, go ahead and throw an emoji in the chat if you're back and ready to go. Hopefully not an inappropriate emoji at all. <laughs> I do not find thumbs inappropriate. <laughs> All right, a few more uh, topics to discuss. Again, today is kind of this the foundation bullet point terms we have to get through, but a lot of possible test questions. Now, let's see if we can get through this topic without being unprofessional. Has anybody heard of the dark web? Of course. Tor. Yep, the onion router, Tor browsers... So, by technical definition, right, this dark web makes up about 85 to 90% of the internet. It's, it's the entire part, portion of the internet that cannot be found by search engine. So, everything that you can go Google and find the website for is not part of the dark web. 
Now, there's a lot of um, mixed uses. And, of course, this whole uh, iceberg analogy is classic when discussing the dark web. The surface web is what basic users are used to seeing. Uh, anybody go back for a second? My bad to hear. Oh, matches. Going back to the 90s with that one. <laughs> good, good. So the, the normal internet is that top section. Getting into the deep and dark web, obviously the definition of deep web, right? Sites that can't be accessed from search engines. This doesn't mean that they're malicious. Not all of them are malicious. But they're simply not be able to be accessed from search engines. So this could be internal web servers. This, this could be secure, you know, um, file servers. It could be anything that's not accessible from the outside. Now, I think with the dark web, a lot of us start thinking about illegal purposes, like the Silk Road, for example. Um, if you don't know what the Silk Road is, it is an eBay in the dark web that sells everything. Uh, the Silk Road's still around. Um, I don't suggest you ever go there unless you want to get on a list real quick. But for the CompT exam, the difference, the only thing you have to know about the, the dark web, I don't think deep web is even actually mentioned in the objective. So I think it's just blanket defined as dark web. Anything that cannot be found by search engine. Yeah, don't go don't go to the Silk Road. I, I'm not going to say it's illegal to visit there, but you're going to be monitored if if you do. Um, so hold on, the deep web and the dark web, uh, you can still access it through a normal browser. It's just that you can that a search engine does not show the results. Um, some of it you might be able to get to with a browser. Some of it you might have to have a specific invite to a tour. Okay, got it. Like use a, use a, using a, a Tor browser or a specific Tor router or an invite to a proxy that's a Tor router. So, yeah. Um, well, remember, the, ob the objective list kind of just blanket defines all this as the dark web. The, the deep web versus dark web are getting more specific, and I think that's beyond Security Plus. More so... I think, I think the only thing I've ever seen is, hey, know that the surface web is publicly accessible through search engine. The dark web or deep web is not. Invite only or for other purposes, not publicly accessible. Uh, so class E public IP addresses, I believe, are, are reserved for government or experimental by definition. But keep in mind... Uh, the resources down here don't exactly have to follow any rules. So I want to go ahead and plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> now, some tools that you might actually use. Has anybody used the Abuse, uh, Abuse IPDB? Abuse IP database? No, never. Shodan's very similar. Yep. If you, if you have a free or paid for version of that. So, um... Reputational intelligence is kind of cool. Let's go on a field trip real quick. Let's go on a field trip to abuse IPDB. IPDB, if I can spell IPDB. So abuse IPDB is, is basically an open forum that you can research and check domains. So if I go to www.amazon.com, this website will, will give me a reputational outlook on amazon.com. And it says, here's the host. It's trusted. There's not really uh, there's not really any negative reports found for IPDB. So uh, one, I had I had a friend that was job searching recently, and I guess there's a lot of scam crap on job forums now. Um, but Virus Total is another one that's that's really good. Um, as I think it's actually in the uh, slides, but VirusTotal is another reputational database. 
where you can look at URL or virus total can be used if you're working in security and hey, somebody got an attachment and they're claiming that it's a legitimate attachment. You can open up a virtual machine, toss that attachment into virus total, and virus total will tell you, hey, that is a malicious attachment or not. So virus total is another valuable tool when it comes to like reputational intelligence. I'll get through the links for these two in if you want to play with them. But, I mean, I would save these. Try them on your own. Um, go go to your junk email. Go into your junk email and find some of those websites and throw them into Abuse IPDB. You'll see exactly what it says about a lot of those. Has anybody gotten the uh, job offer for $120,000 a year for eight hours of work a week? Remote? From an unnamed company? None of those magical job offers. <laughs> yep. Throw, throw some of those domains into uh, Abuse IPDB and see what happens. Some good free open source tools to use. Whoops. Where we at? Uh, Talos Intelligence. I, I, forgot, I can't believe I forgot about this one. Uh, Cisco's Talos Intelligence is also another awesome one. So if you're wondering, hey, is this website or this is this company legit? Abuse IPDB and Talos will tell you. Yes, it's, it's it has a good reputation or no. You know, it has this many red X's on its history. Oh, Tigger. <laughs> it's all right. Don't get demoralized. Remember, you can have 99 rejected jobs, but that 100th one is the one you're looking for, right? So Talos Intelligence is another one that is awesome and very well known for reputation, especially when it comes to uh, domains. Sorry, someone's messaging in the uh, security chat, not the not the voice chat. Uh, go back one slide to this one. Cool, cool. Now a TTP. This definition comes right from NIST. But really, a TTP, Tactics, Techniques, and Procedures. So if you work for a large organization, they might have TTPs or basically documentation on a given threat actor. Uh, IBM X-Force is also a very well-known uh, reputation intelligence tool. That's another good one, yeah. I, I forgot about IBM's X-Force. I shouldn't have. They, I, I, I've been getting... A thousand emails a month from them for about five years. If you sign up for their their X Force, they blow up your inbox. I would make an inbox rule. <laughs> yes, and we are building towards that miter miter attack chart taker for sure. But a tag, a TTP is basically, hey, here's here's the information we have on a specific threat actor. And it could be a known hacking group. It could be an entire region. Um, for example. In my experience, a huge amount of malware comes right from the Russian Federation. So we have an entire TTP document on, hey, their most common attack vectors. What have they tried the most? So a TTP is just a document or a, a, rec a recorded set of details on how and why an attacker is attacking. And if you want to get real nerdy, NIST SP800-150. Not that you, have to, you don't have to memorize that, by the way. Don't stress about that for the exam. I'm more so worried that when you see this, this acronym TTP, what it is.
Any questions, or am I explaining this well enough? TTP. Yes. Okay. Did you already explain it in the real world scenario? Uh, I mean, not really. It's kind of vague, but at the same time, I mean, like my my company, we have documents on specific regions like Russia. Like I can pull up a few different interfaces and show my boss, hey, from the Russian Federation in the last six months, here's the most common attack they've tried. Oh yeah. Here's you know here's here's all the names of the the specific pieces of malware they've tried to approach with everything. But like I said, it doesn't have to be a company. It can be a hacker group or any attack or any threat actor at all can have their own TTP if they're uh, dangerous enough. How are we doing on a scale of 1 to 10? Let's get a vote. 1 means we're bored. 10 means my brain hurts. How are we doing on 1 to 10? Okay, 169. High numbers, 420. All right. Hey, at least we're not bored. That's, that's good news, right? <laughs> None in between. Okay, okay. Just just doing a pulse check. So, so someone asked for an example of a TTP. So just think of it this way. Anytime a company, a large company, is collecting data on attackers... Like, for example, a well-known hacker group. Like, uh, I don't know if they're around still. The the Revel? No. I, I think a lot of them got arrested. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they're still around. <laughs> I, yeah, they're... <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think all of them got arrested, but some of them got arrested. But if that group is attacking specific banks or specific government websites or something like that, that bank or that government website will have a TTP. Think of it like a folder that is basically a history of everything that that hacker group has tried to do. So, hey, this hacker group tried to execute a DDoS, and they tried to execute cross-site scripting, and they sent out phishing emails to all of our employees given our website's domain. And it's basically like a history of why they're trying to attack and what tactics they've used in the past. Would you consider it almost like the MO of like a serial killer? Yeah, it could be. Absolutely. A dossier of the threat actor? Pretty much. Pretty much. And, I mean, it. I keep bringing up the Russian Federation. Man, I, I've, got, I've got a mountain of documents that I could print for the Russian Federation today. 100% blocked, but oddly enough... <laughs> You see a lot of similarities in a lot of the, the same attack vectors they try to execute. Uh, does that help kind of define what a TTP is, Ashok? Cool, cool, good, good. All right. Hey, indicator of compromise. The NIST definition for indicator of compromise is indicator of compromise. <laughs> that's, a, that's the entire definition on the NIST website, so I thought I'd share it with you guys. To be honest, <laughs> the name is so straightforward, it doesn't take that much um, explanation. I, I agree. It is kind of self-explanatory, right? Um, but this acronym, IOC, an indicator of compromise is any symptom of an attack or malware you can think of is an indicator of compromise. So it could be anything from, hey, my network bandwidth was great yesterday and trash today. That could be an indicator of compromise. Uh, hey, no one can get online today. That's an indicator of compromise. Or our website's very slow. It wasn't yesterday. That's anything that is a symptom of a possible attack is an indicator of compromise. 
Maybe maybe my boss calls me and says, why would you send really nasty emails to all the executives all night? I might say, I didn't. That's an indicator of compromise, right? If I didn't send those emails, that's an indicator of compromise. So IOC can be literally any symptom of an attack. How do I feel about VPNs? They're fantastic. I mean, like for home, is, for home use? My, my is there a is, place where you cannot utilize a VPN? Because there's like a lot of uh, there's like a lot of um, connections that you could do that you can use a VPN. But is there any network connection that you do not use a VPN? Uh, there. So. G Yes, two answers to that. Some countries don't allow VPNs. So in some some countries, they're the illegal. The USA is trying to become one of those. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> that that'll never happen. Um, well, it, it that's hard to outlaw completely because VPNs are used for security purposes. Like on days that I work from home, I can't access anything. Because you have to be inside of my network to get into any of our platforms. There's no other way to do that other than remoting in in a secure manner or using a VPN. Um, so VPNs have a lot of secure, legit functions. But at the same time, like, for example, I highly suggest NordVPN. Anybody use Nord or Express? I use NordVPN. I mean, I heard about that compromise that they had or whatever where they didn't disclose, you know, that like a lot of their information was compromised, compromised, but I use it and I think it's fantastic. And I love NordVPN. Um, it's hosted in Panama and they use a whole global set of proxy servers. So, I mean, the U.S. can, the US can say, hey, they're illegal, but there's no technical way to enforce that. So I, I don't think we're going to have to worry about it. Um, another issue where you cannot use a VPN, you know, if there are certain um, access control methods that prevent a VPN. So some really secure environments might use like your IP address to make sure you're in the network. They might combine that with your geolocation to make sure your phone is physically inside the network. And then if you don't have both of those, you can't get on the network. So in that case, a VPN would be locked out, right? If you're being right, that makes sense. Geo tracked and IP address tracked. So basically, NAC. Yeah. Yep. Depending on the network access control, it could really mess with VPN functionality. What are you guys talking about? Panera, Panera Bread doesn't allow VPNs. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds kind of crazy. We had people complaining that they weren't able to do their work on lunch at a Panera Bread, and they couldn't connect to the Wi-Fi, so they called in asking us to help them, and it turns out that they're, they they block them. Ooh, I'm going to have to take a visit to Panera and see uh, see what shenanigans I can... <laughs> yes, collect everyone's yeah. information. Yeah. All right. OSINT. Has anybody ever heard of this term? Yep, I hear it all the time. Open source intelligence. This can be really dangerous. Check this out. Has anybody ever Googled themselves before? No. I mean, you should definitely try to Google yourself. I mean, I could not, yeah. I could not believe what they had on me. Look at this. What kind of <laughs> what kind of data collection shenanigans is this? <laughs> Man. Google myself, they keep showing me the picture down at the uh, post office. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how they got all this information, but OSINT, that acronym, <laughs> is literally uh, j just defines open source intelligence, what you can publicly find. Of course, this isn't real. Um, for those of you that were in A plus and Net plus, we, we we went through how easy it is to change the look of a website, right? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end here for uh, April Fools. It is my favorite holiday. Um, but OSINT is literally just open source intelligence. So there's a lot of OSINT resources you can use. Um, on the flip side to that, 
like when I was hiring uh, people at CompTIA, I used open source intelligence as often as I could. If I was hiring an instructor, I mean, I was going to look at every social media post, every post about them, anything I could find before we brought that person in for an interview. Um, so do, do me a favor. Go Google yourself. Try to find information on yourself and see if anything shocking comes up. Virus total, open source intelligence, uh, falls under that still. We already kind of talked about that there, right? What about if the person made their account private? Um, I mean, with social media, that works if they really did make their stuff private. A lot of basic users think their stuff is private. And, well, not really so much. OSINT framework. Um, speaking of OSINT and open source intelligence, sorry, quick uh, quick field trip. Have you guys used Have I Been Pwned before? Never. So this is actually now a an FBI collaborative website where FBI is partnered, but definitely not a honeypot. But Have I Been Pwned is really interesting. So it, it, it's actually, this website is printed in CompTIA's official textbooks, which is interesting too. But you can go here and put in your email, your phone number, or you can even, even put in a password, not with your email, of course. But it'll tell you how many recorded breach databases that that information is found in. So for example, um, if you ever want to email me, the Mad Instructor, at gmail.com not that I check it very often but I can click this and it'll say hey this website this email address was not found in any any breach databases now if I go back and research my old hotmail email address that I haven't used in like eight years uh oh this, this email address was found in 12 data breaches. So Cafe Press, some other crap, MySpace, if you remember that. Um, just weird databases, Yahoo. I never use Yahoo, but you can see where your email address is found in breach databases. The password option is also really cool. So if I use if I throw my password in here that I use for all my important stuff, it's not found. But if I use my password that I use for like if I have to make an account for PizzaHut.com or something stupid, yeah, that password's been found like ten thousand times. Um, so. Again, I don't use this for anything that carries my credit card information. Try password123. Password123. That's been found 46,000 times in breach databases. Should I try SolarWinds123? <laughs> no offense to anybody. Try password. It's been over 9 million times. I challenge anyone to find a password that has uh, been found more times than that. Boom. Challenge accepted. Wait, what? <laughs> what was it? <laughs> one, yeah, two, you threw down the gauntlet, dude. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> I, think, I think that still rates the, the easy numeric sequences rate as the top most dangerous. <laughs> so... Check your passwords, um, and especially if you use like if you're like me, I have a separate email just for banking stuff. So check your bank email or the email you use for bank communications. If it's found in a breach database, go make a new email and change it. That's my suggestion. Kind of cool, I think. Kind of cool. Have I been pwned.com? 
All right, I think we're on our like last two slides. So weird acronyms, very very weird acronyms that to to end today. You might see these on the exam. They are on the objective list. However, I have never seen these at any Security Plus exam I've taken. So, if you see STICS, S-T-I-X, as an acronym, this is literally just an XML language for relaying data about security threats. So, STICS, if I was taking notes, STICS is going to be the specific XML language about threats and taxi uh, should be on the next slide. Taxi is the protocol used to transfer sticks info. I'm not convinced you're going to see these in security plus. But they are on the objective list, so I can't say never. Sticks is the programming language used to share cybersecurity threats. Taxi is the protocol, how the, the, the Sticks language is transported. Oh, that's a good question. Um, is private information released in a breach considered OSINT, or does OSINT imply legally obtained? I don't think OSINT would be limited to legally obtained. Because, I mean, if something is breached and then put out into the public, you know, you have a you have a Snowden kind of situation, right? I mean, if a hacker breaches data or breaches and exposes data, that data falls into OSINT. Anybody could use it for whatever purpose they're looking for it for. Oh, no. Don't worry about sticks one and two. Great question about OSINT. If it's out in the public, if it's out in the wild and accessible, it is OSINT. Just to reiterate, I would bet money that you're not going to see sticks and taxi on Security Plus, but we got to hit them because they're on the objectives. We should have an opposite for Penguin. An opposite? A, a possible Penguin? All right. So I did put up some of these threat maps, and the that term threat map is literally a term on the objective list. But a threat map is literally just that. A map that shows all live security events happening currently. So this is Kaspersky's threat map, and it isolates the type of attacks, most attacked countries, and you can even see specific, uh, I believe that symbol is for a botnet occurring in the middle of the U.S., but the types of attacks and where they're going to and from. So a lot of SOCs will have some attack maps up as a visual, as a generic overview. Oh, yeah. Here, so here's the Kaspersky attack map. I'll throw that into the link. And I think Bitdefender has a pretty sweet attack map, if I remember correctly. These are, the, I mean, there's a bunch of them. These are just two that came off the top of my head. Yeah, Bitdefender's got a nice, nice one. If you want to, you can use Wallpaper Engine to create, make these your wallpaper, make the websites your wallpaper, but... Really? When... When you think of cyber attacks, a lot of people think there, there's a few a day. There are thousands per minute. It never stops. Um, and, and these attack maps are a real good visual indicator of how awesome uh, the volume of attacks are. It seems like the U.S. gets attacked a lot. <laughs> I'm so shocked. Now, mind you, a lot of these look like they're coming from Europe specifically, and they could be, but also keep in mind that Oceanic Fiber Line connects the U.S. from this uh, this west coast of Europe. 
So I don't, I'm not, I, I'd be lying if I said I could trust how accurate these really are. But it's a good visual of the pure number of attacks, I think. It looks fun. It looks fun, yeah. I always, I always show my classes, like, look, Iceland never gets attacked. They have internet. They just never, I've never seen a blip on Iceland ever. Oh, no. I saw one. <laughs> Sorry. Nerding out a little bit. <laughs> but threat maps, I mean, that term threat map is on the objective list. So it's literally just that. A map that visualizes the threats currently happening. Nobody must have messed with them Viking hackers. All right. I think this acronym came up in chat more than anything else today. CVE. So a CVE is a uniform way to actually name and identify vulnerabilities. And a little bit later, we're going to go deeper into the MITRE attack matrices and the charts in the MITRE.org. But that's also a really good resource. Um, understanding CVEs, though. One, uh, so I, I, I put this as an example. Um, has anybody heard of the Hanadabot? No, no. This is a new attack vector that came out like last week, early last week. And ultimately what this is, it's a DDoS that's capable of over three terabits per second hitting one target, which is very dangerous. It's a, it's, this DDoS attack is capable of huge amounts of traffic to disrupt website functionality. But... You know, as, as an engineer, we're looking at the new attacks that come out, and we're like, okay, it relies on a specific vendor, set of routers, and network devices, so we don't have to worry about it there. But it also, on top of that, relied on some specific CVEs. So this is what a CVE looks like when you actually get it in, in, in an alert or an email or a posting or a vendor communication or whatever. The CVE will always be in this format. CVE dash the year it was discovered dash the unique identifier. So from my point of view, I looked at these and I'm like, oh, so this is a terrible attack, but it relies on CVEs from 2014 and 2017, which off the top of my head, I know for a fact my company doesn't have to worry about. We can't have CVEs that old in the environment. It's not a not an acceptable thing in life, but we check it anyway, right? So we check our environments to make sure these specific CVEs are not there; they don't exist anywhere in our purview, and we specifically make sure we're not using this crap, which we're not anyway. So a lot of secure environments don't have to worry about that. If you're working somewhere that's using this brand of router that I'm not going to try to pronounce, and you have this CVE listed on a vulnerability scan somewhere that hasn't been remediated, you are in the crosshairs for this specific brand new DDoS attack. And that, that in a nutshell is what a security analyst or a security engineer will do. You're going to be making sure, hey, here's a discovered attack. Let's make sure we're protected against it. Uh, go back one slide, sure. The Iron Curtain of Firewalls, yep. I'm lucky enough to work for a relatively large company that has defense in depth solidified. <laughs> Ooh, a brand new CVE. Ashok, you want to take a look at it? It might be a learning tool here. Um, I believe that was the last slide anyway. So, fair warning, if you're attending class next Saturday, everything we talked about today is free game on our quiz. Free game. Um, not a lot of difficult terms, but there might be, does anybody admit they have some memorization to do this week? Yeah, I definitely do. Yep. 
So Ashok what was said, that? I forgot what you said. <laughs> yeah. So Ashok said that their environment was looking at this specific CBE. So one, it was discovered in the last three months. It's 2023. Uh, let's look, so we can have a look at Microsoft.com or NIST specifically. I'm gonna, if I was working this CVE, I want to look at both of those. Hey, look, MITRE. Let's go ahead and look at that too. So, oh, a privilege escalation via Microsoft Outlook. Interesting. Um, Tech Factor Network. So looking at the Microsoft one, this metric reflects the context by which vulnerability exploitation is possible. So it's a network attack over or through Microsoft Outlook that's trying to utilize a privilege escalation type of attack. Okay, let's see, let's see, let's see. Scope. Mm -hmm. Not a lot here on this. So Microsoft acknowledges that it exists. Um, remediation level. Uh oh. So Microsoft's like, hey, vendor has issued a patch to fix this. So if I were in an environment and I ran a vulnerability scan or this this CVE popped up, Microsoft's like, yep, we acknowledge that there is this possible uh, ele elevated privileges attack through Outlook. And they said they released a patch to fix it. So what would be your first step in that environment when you see this and encounter this information? Update. Whether it's, I mean, maybe. It's, well, that's only if there's a patch available for it. Yep. And, and going into this, I didn't know if there was or not. I'm this, I've seen this for the first time. So there, there's a patch. Um, there it is. Boom. Well, if there wasn't a patch, then the next thing you would do is, if it is not uh, critical to um, the organization or the company that you're working for, you can make it to where you disable the uh, uh, you disable it, or you know you don't access it until there's a patch. True. Yeah. Um, some. Or, I mean, it's it's Outlook, so it'd be hard to do in a lot of organizations. Um, but even though it is Microsoft Outlook, Microsoft's pretty good about if there's a CVE associated with one of their platforms, they fix it quick. Um, but you're right. If there's not a patch for it from the vendor, maybe look at, hey, is, it, is it utilizing a specific port? Is it dependent on something else in the environment? There's a lot of other ways you can go about trying to, trying to lower your risk to that threat, right? That was a good example. Solid example. All right, what do we think about today's uh, list of bullet points? Although not the most exciting, definitely a crap ton of possible test questions. Questions, concerns, complaints, comments. Complaint, it's too short. Let's go for the entire day. Yeah, Jeez. yeah. Are you saying you're ready for that quiz now? Um. Well, actually, I've been uh, I've been studying for like a while. I have a lot of study resources. I'm just uh, oh, right nice. now. I'm in stage where I'm taking a bunch of practice tests and stuff. The only reason I'm here is, you know, in case if there's something that. You know, just for recap, um, like within, uh, I think like next week or so, I'm probably going to take the test. I'm ready for it, but I'm just, you know, making sure I'm ready for it. Let me, uh, I'll do some digging and see if I still have some of my old uh, Security Plus finals for you, uh, if you're uh, interested in those. Oh, if if you do that for me, I'd, I'd love to. Um, I, I'd, I'd love that. Um, yes, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Cool. I have, to, I have to check. I haven't I haven't officially taught as a job in about a year and a half, so uh, I gotta see if I still have those around somewhere. <laughs> cool. 
Uh, so SMB ports, we will discuss that a little bit later. That's a that's a topic that has a lot of branches we have to cover. Not just on SMB, but how it's used and how it's used securely and how it's sometimes not so much used securely. Yeah. That's a topic we definitely have to hit. <laughs> uh, if you are watching this recording, uh, I will see you next time.